With my preparation for another trial, I made an effort to simplify my life still further. I felt that my way of living did not yet befit the modest means of my family. The thought of my struggling brother, who nobly responded to my regular calls for monetary help, deeply pained me. I saw that. Most of those who were spending from 8 to 15 pounds monthly had the advantage of scholarships. I had before me examples of much simpler living. I came across a fair number of poor students living more humbly than I. One of them was staying in the slums in a room at two shillings a week and living on two pence worth of cocoa and bread per meal from Lockhart's cheap cocoa rooms. It was far from me to think of emulating him, but I felt I could surely have one room instead of two and cook some of my meals at home. That would be a saving of four to five pounds each month. I also came across books on simple living. I gave up the suite of rooms and rented one instead, invested in a stove and began cooking my breakfast at home. The process scarcely took me more than 20 minutes for there was only oatmeal porridge to cook and water to boil for cocoa. I had lunch out and for dinner bread and cocoa at home. Thus I managed to live on a shilling and three pence a day. This was also a period of intensive study. Plain living saved me plenty of time and I passed my examination. Let not the reader think that this living made my life by any means a dreary affair. On the contrary, the change harmonized my inward and outward life. It was also more in keeping with the means of my family. My life was certainly more truthful and my soul knew no bounds of joy. Chapter 17 Experiments in Dietetics As I searched myself deeper, the necessity for changes both internal and external began to grow on me. As soon as or even before, I made alterations in my expenses and my way of living. I began to make changes in my diet. I saw that the writers on vegetarianism had examined the question very minutely, attacking it in its religious, scientific, practical and medical aspects. Ethically they had arrived at the conclusion that man's supremacy over the lower animals meant not that the former should prey upon the latter, but that the higher should protect the lower and that there should be mutual aid between the two as between man and man. They had also brought out the truth that man eats not for enjoyment but to live. And some of them accordingly suggested and effected in their lives abstention not only from flesh meat but from eggs and milk. Scientifically some had concluded that man's physical structure showed that he was not meant to be a cooking but a frugivorous animal that he could take only his mother's milk and, as soon as he teeth should begin to take solid foods. Medically they had suggested the rejection of all spices and condiments. According to the practical and economic argument they had demonstrated that a vegetarian diet was the least expensive. All these considerations had their effect on me and I came across vegetarians of all these types in vegetarian restaurants. There was a vegetarian society in England with a weekly journal of its own. I subscribed to the weekly, joined the society, and very shortly found myself on the executive committee. Here I came in contact with those who were regarded as pillars of vegetarianism and began my own experiments in dietetics. I stopped taking the sweets and condiments I had got from home. The mind having taken a different turn, the fondness for condiments wore away and I now relished the boiled spinach, which in Richmond tasted insipid, cooked without condiments. Many such experiments taught me that the real seat of taste was not the tongue but the mind. The economic consideration was of course constantly before me. There was in those days a body of opinion which regarded tea and coffee as harmful and favored cocoa. And as I was convinced that one should eat only articles that sustained the body, I gave up tea and coffee as a rule and substituted cocoa. There were two divisions in the restaurants I used to visit. One division, which was patronized by fairly well-to-do people, provided any number of courses from which one chose and paid for a la carte each dinner thus costing from one to two shillings. The other division provided six penny dinners of three courses with a slice of bread. 
In my days of strict frugality I usually dined in the second division. There were many minor experiments going on along with the main one, as for example, giving up. Starchy foods at one time, living on bread and fruit alone at another, and once living on cheese. Milk and eggs. This last experiment is worth noting. It lasted not even a fortnight. The reformer, who advocated starchless food had spoken highly of eggs and held that eggs were not meat. It was apparent that there was no injury done to living creatures in taking eggs. I was taken in by this plea and took eggs in spite of my vow. But the lapse was momentary. I had no business to put a new interpretation on the vow. The interpretation of my mother who administered the vow was there for me. I knew that her definition of meat included eggs. And as soon as I saw the true import of the vow I gave up eggs and the experiment alike. There is a nice point underlying the argument and worth noting. I came across three definitions of meat in England. According to the first, meat denoted only the flesh of birds and beasts. Vegetarians who accepted that definition abjured the flesh of birds and beasts but ate fish not to mention eggs. According to the second definition, meat meant flesh of all living creatures. So fish was here out of the question but eggs were allowed. The third definition as all their products, thus covering eggs and milk alike. If I accepted the first definition, I could take not only eggs but fish also. But I was convinced that my mother's definition was the definition binding on me. If, therefore, I would observe the vow I had taken, I must abjure eggs. I therefore did so. This was a hardship inasmuch as inquiry showed that even in vegetarian restaurants many courses used to contain eggs. This meant that unless I knew what was what, I had to go through the awkward process of ascertaining whether a particular course contained eggs or no, for many puddings and cakes were not free from them. But though the revelation of my duty caused this difficulty it simplified my food. The simplification in its turn brought me annoyance in that I had to give up several dishes I had come to relish. These difficulties were only passing for the strict observance of the vow produced an inward relish distinctly more healthy, delicate and permanent. The real ordeal, however, was still to come and that was in respect of the other vow. But who dare harm whom God protects? A few observations about the interpretation of vows or pledges may not be out of place here. Interpretation of pledges has been a fruitful source of strife all the world over. No matter how explicit the pledge, people will turn and twist the text to suit their own purposes. They are to be met with among all classes of society, from the rich down to the poor, from the prince down to the peasant. Selfishness turns them blind and by a use of the ambiguous middle they deceive themselves and seek to deceive the world and God. One golden rule is to accept the interpretation honestly put on the pledge by the party administering it. Another is to accept the interpretation of the weaker party where there are two interpretations possible. Rejection of these two rules gives rise to strife and iniquity which are rooted in untruthfulness. He who seeks truth alone easily follows the golden rule. He need not seek learned advice for interpretation. My mother's interpretation of meat was, according to the golden rule, the only true one for me and not the one my wider experience or my pride of better knowledge might have taught me. My experiments in England were conducted from the point of view of economy and hygiene. The religious aspect of the question was not considered until I went to South Africa where I undertook strenuous experiments which will be narrated later. The seed, however, for all of them was sown. In England, a convert's enthusiasm for his new religion is greater than that of a person who is born in it. Vegetarianism was then a new cult in England, and likewise for me, because, as we have seen, I had gone there a convinced meat-eater, and was intellectually converted to vegetarianism later. Full of the neophyte zeal for vegetarianism, I decided to start a vegetarian club in my locality, Bayswater. I invited Sir Edwin Arnold, who lived there, to be vice president. 
Dr. Oldfield who was editor of the The Vegetarian became president. I myself became the secretary. The club went well for a while but came to an end in the course of a few months. For I left the locality according to my custom of moving from place to place periodically. But this brief and modest experience gave me some little training in organizing and conducting institutions. Chapter 18. Shyness My Shield. I was elected to the executive committee of the Vegetarian Society and made it a point to attend every one of its meetings, but I always felt tongue-tied. Dr. Oldfield once said to me, you talk to me quite all right, but why is it that you never open your lips at a committee meeting? You are a drone. I appreciated the banter. The bees are ever busy, the drone is a thorough idler. And it was not a little curious that whilst others expressed their opinions at these meetings, I sat quite silent. Not that I never felt tempted to speak, but I was at a loss to know how to express myself. All the rest of the members appeared to me to be better informed than I. Then I often happened. That just when I had mustered up courage to speak, a fresh subject would be started. This went on for a long time. Meantime a serious question came up for discussion. I thought it wrong to be absent and felt it. Cowardice to register a silent vote. The discussion arose somewhat in this wise. The president of the society was Mr. Hills, proprietor of the Thames Iron Works. He was a Puritan. It may be said that the existence of the society depended practically on his financial assistance. Many members of the committee were more or less his protégés. Dr. Allenson of vegetarian fame was also a member of the committee. He was an advocate of the then new birth control movement and preached its methods among the working classes. Mr. Hills regarded these methods as cutting at the root of morals. He thought that the vegetarian society had for its object not only dietetic but also moral reform and that a man of Dr. Allenson's anti-puritanic views should not be allowed to remain in the society. A motion was therefore brought for his removal. The question deeply interested me. I considered Dr. Allenson's views regarding artificial methods of birth control as dangerous and I believed that Mr. Hills was entitled, as a Puritan, to oppose him. I had also a high regard for Mr. Hills and his generosity. But I thought it was quite improper to exclude a man from a vegetarian society simply because he refused to regard Puritan morals as one of the objects of the society. Mr. Hills' view regarding the exclusion of anti-Puritans from the society was personal to himself and it had nothing to do with the declared object of the society, which was simply the promotion of vegetarianism and not of any system of morality. I therefore held that any vegetarian could be a member of the society irrespective of his views on other morals. There were in the committee others also who shared my view, but I felt myself personally called upon to express my own. How to do it was the question. I had not the courage to speak and I therefore decided to set down my thoughts in writing. I went to the meeting with the document in my pocket. So far as I recollect, I did not find myself equal even to reading it and the president had it read by someone else. Dr. Allenson lost the day. Thus in the very first battle of the kind I found myself siding with the losing party. But I had comfort in the thought that the cause was Right. I have a faint recollection that, after this incident, I resigned from the committee. This shyness I retained throughout my stay in England. Even when I paid a social call the presence of half a dozen or more people would strike me dumb. I once went to Ventnor with SJT Masmuter. We stayed there with a vegetarian family. Mr. Howard, the author of The Ethics of Diet, was also staying at the same watering place. Vimit. Him and he invited us to speak at a meeting for the promotion of vegetarianism. I had ascertained that it was not considered incorrect to read one's speech. I knew that many did so to express themselves coherently and briefly. To speak extempore would have been out of the 
question for me. I had therefore written down my speech. I stood up to read it, but could not. My vision became blurred and I trembled, though the speech hardly covered a sheet of fool's cap. SJT. Masmuter had to read it for me. His own speech was of course excellent and was received with applause. I was ashamed of myself and sad at heart for my incapacity. My last effort to make a public speech in England was on the eve of my departure for home. But this time too I only succeeded in making myself ridiculous. I invited my vegetarian friends to dinner in the Holborn restaurant referred to in these chapters. A vegetarian dinner could be had. I said to myself, in vegetarian restaurants as a matter of course. But why should it not be possible in a non-vegetarian restaurant too? And I arranged with the manager of the Holborn restaurant to provide a strictly vegetarian meal. The vegetarians hailed the new experiment with delight. All dinners are meant for enjoyment, but the West has developed the thing into an art. They are celebrated with great eclat, music and speeches. And the little dinner party that I gave was also not unaccompanied by some such display. Speeches, therefore, there had to be. When my turn for speaking came, I stood up to make a speech. I had with great care thought out one, which would consist of a very few sentences. But I could not proceed beyond the first sentence. I had read of Addison that he began his maiden speech in the House of Commons, repeating I conceived three times, and when he could proceed no further, a wag stood up and said, The gentleman conceived thrice but brought forth nothing. I had thought of making a humorous speech taking this anecdote as the text. I therefore began with it and stuck there. My memory entirely failed me and in attempting a humorous for having kindly responded to my invitation, I said abruptly and sat down. It was only in South Africa that I got over this shyness, though I never completely overcame it. It was impossible for me to speak impromptu. I hesitated whenever I had to face strange audiences and avoided making a speech whenever I could. Even today I do not think I could or would even be inclined to keep a meeting of friends engaged in idle talk. I must say that, beyond occasionally exposing me to laughter, my constitutional shyness has been no disadvantage whatever. In fact I can see that, on the contrary, it has been all to my advantage. My hesitancy in speech, which was once an annoyance, is now a pleasure. Its greatest benefit has been that it has taught me the economy of words. I have naturally formed the habit of restraining my thoughts. And I can now give myself the certificate that a thoughtless word hardly ever escapes my tongue or pen. I do not recollect ever having had to regret anything in my speech or writing. I have thus been spared many a mishap and waste of time. Experience has taught me that silence is part of the spiritual discipline of a votary of truth. Proneness to exaggerate, to suppress or modify the truth, wittingly or unwittingly, is a natural weakness of man. And silence is necessary in order to surmount it. A man of few words will rarely be thoughtless in his speech, he will measure every word. We find so many people impatient to talk. There is no chairman of a meeting who is not pestered with notes for permission to speak. And whenever the permission is given the speaker generally exceeds the time limit, asks for more time, and keeps on talking without permission. All this talking can hardly be said to be of my benefit to the world. It is so much waste of time. My shyness has been in reality my shield and buckler. It has allowed me to grow. It has helped me in my discernment of truth. Chapter 19 The Canker of Untruth There were comparatively few Indian students in England 40 years ago. It was a practice with them to affect the bachelor even though they might be married. School or college students in England are all bachelors, studies being regarded as incompatible with married life. We had that tradition in the good old days, a student then being invariably known as a Brahmakari. But in 
These days we have child marriages, a thing practically unknown in England. Indian Yuzin. England, therefore, felt ashamed to confess that they were married. There was also another. Reason for dissembling, namely that in the event of the fact being known it would be impossible. For the young men to go about or flirt with the young girls of the family in which they lived. The flirting was more or less innocent. Parents even encouraged it and that sort of association. Between young men and young women may even be a necessity there, in view of the fact that every young man has to choose his mate. If, however, Indian youths on arrival in England indulge. In these relations, quite natural to English youths, the result is likely to be disastrous, as has often been found. I saw that our youths had succumbed to the temptation and chosen a life of untruth. For the sake of companionships which, however innocent in the case of English youths, were for them undesirable. I too caught the contagion. I did not hesitate to pass myself off as a bachelor. Though I was married and the father of a son. But I was none the happier for being a dissembler. Only my reserve and my reticence saved me from going into deeper waters. If I did not talk, no. Girl would think it worth her while to enter into conversation with me or to go out with me. My cowardice was on a par with my reserve. It was customary in families like the one in which I was staying at Ventnor for the daughter of the landlady to take out guests for a walk. My landlady's daughter took me one day to the lovely hills round Ventnor. I was no slow walker, but my companion walked even faster, dragging me after her and chattering away all the while. I responded to her chatter sometimes with a whispered yes or no, or at the most yes, how beautiful. She was flying like a bird whilst I was wondering when I should get back home. We thus reached the top of a hill. How to get down again was the question. In spite of her high heel boots this sprightly young lady of 25 darted down the hill like an arrow. I was shamefacedly struggling to get down. She stood at the foot smiling and cheering me and offering to come and drag me. How could I be so chicken-hearted? With the greatest difficulty and crawling at intervals, I somehow managed to scramble to the bottom. She loudly laughed bravo and shamed me all the more as well she might. But I could not escape scatheless everywhere. For God wanted to rid me of the canker of untruth. I once went to Brighton, another watering place like Ventnor. This was before the Ventnor visit. I met there at a hotel an old widow of moderate means. This was my first year in England. The courses on the menu were all described in French, which I did not understand. I sat at the same table as the old lady. She saw that I was a stranger and puzzled and immediately came to my aid. You seem to be a stranger, she said, and looked perplexed. Why have you not ordered anything? I was spelling through the menu and preparing to ascertain the ingredients of the courses from the waiter when the good lady thus intervened. I thanked her and explaining my difficulty told her that I was at a loss to know which of the courses were vegetarian as I did not understand French. Let me help you, she said. I shall explain the card to you and show you what you may eat. I gratefully availed myself of her help. This was the beginning of an acquaintance that ripened into friendship and was kept up all through my stay in England and long after. She gave me her London address and invited me to dine at her house every Sunday. On special occasions also. She would invite me, help me to conquer my bashfulness and introduce me to young ladies and draw me into conversation with them. Particularly marked out for these conversations was a young lady who stayed with her and often we would be left entirely alone together. I found all this very trying at first. I could not start a conversation nor could I indulge in any jokes. But she put me in the way. I began to learn and in course of time looked forward to every Sunday and came to like the conversations with the young friend. The old lady went on spreading her net wider every day. She felt interested in our meetings. Possibly she had her own plans about us. I was in a quandary. How I wished I had told the good lady that I was married. 
I said to myself. She would then have not thought of an engagement between us. It is, however, never too late to. Men. If I declare the truth, I might yet be saved more misery. With these thoughts in my mind, I wrote a letter to her somewhat to this effect. Ever since we met at Brighton you have been kind to me. You have taken care of me even as a mother of her son. You also think that I should get married and with that view you have been introducing me to young ladies. Rather than allow matters to go further, I must confess to you that I have been unworthy of your affection. I should have told you when I began my visits to you that I was married. I knew that Indian students in England dissembled the fact of their marriage and I followed suit. I now see that I should not have done so. I must also add that I was married while yet a boy and am the father of a son. I am pained that I should have kept this knowledge from you so long. But I am glad God has now given me the courage to speak out the truth. Will you forgive me? I assure you I have taken no improper liberties with the young lady you were good. Enough to introduce to me. I knew my limits. You, not knowing that I was married, naturally, desired that we should be engaged. In order that things should not go beyond the present stage, I must tell you the truth. If on receipt of this, you feel that I have been unworthy of your hospitality, I assure you I shall not take it amiss. You have laid me under an everlasting debt of gratitude by your kindness and solicitude. If, after this, you do not reject me but continue to regard me as worthy of your hospitality, which I will spare no pains to deserve, I shall naturally be happy and count it a further token of your kindness. Let the reader know that I could not have written such a letter in a moment. I must have drafted and redrafted it many times over. But it lifted a burden that was weighing me down. Almost by return post came her reply somewhat as follows. I have your frank letter. We were both very glad and had a hearty laugh over it. The untruth you say you have been guilty of is pardonable. But it is well that you have acquainted us with the real state of things. My invitation still stands and we shall certainly expect you next Sunday and look forward to hearing all about your child marriage and to the pleasure of laughing at your expense. Need I assure you that our friendship is not in the least affected by this incident? I thus purged myself of the canker of untruth and I never thenceforward hesitated to talk of my married state wherever necessary. Chapter 20. Acquaintance with Religions. Towards the end of my second year in England I came across two theosophists, brothers, and both unmarried. They talked to me about the Gita. They were reading Sir Edwin Arnold's translation the song Celestial and they invited me to read the original with them. I felt ashamed. As I had read the divine poem neither in Sanskrit nor in Gujarati. I was constrained to tell them that I had not read the Gita but that I would gladly read it with them and that though my knowledge of Sanskrit was meager, still I hoped to be able to understand the original to them. Meaning. I began reading the Gita with them. The verses in the second chapter if one ponders on. Objects of the sense, there springs attraction, from attraction grows desire, desire flames to fierce. Passion, passion breeds recklessness, then the memory all betrayed lets noble purpose go, and saps the mind till purpose, mind, and man are all undone. Made a deep impression on my mind. And they still ring in my ears. The book struck me as one of priceless worth. The impression has ever since been growing on me with the result that I regard it today as the book par excellence for the knowledge of truth. It has afforded me invaluable help in my moments of gloom. I have read almost all the English translations of it and I regard Sir Edwin Arnold's as the best. He has been faithful to the text and yet it does not read like a translation. Though I read the Gita with these friends, I cannot pretend to have studied it then. It was only after some years that it became a book of daily reading. The brothers also recommended The Light of Asia by Sir Edwin Arnold, whom I knew till then as the author only of the song Celestial, and I read it with even greater interest than I did the Bhagavad Gita. 
Once I had begun it I could not leave off. They also took me on one occasion to the Blavatsky Lodge and introduced me to Madame Blavatsky and Mrs. Besant. The latter had just then joined the Theosophical Society and I was following with great interest the controversy about her conversion. The friends advised me to join the society but I politely declined saying, with my meager knowledge of my own religion I do not want to belong to any religious body. I recall having read at the brother's instance Madame Blavatsky's Key to Theosophy. This book stimulated in me the desire to read books on Hinduism and disabused me of the notion fostered by the missionaries that Hinduism was rife with superstition. About the same time I met a good Christian from Manchester in a vegetarian boarding house. He talked to me about Christianity. I narrated to him my Rajkot recollections. He was pained to hear them. He said, I am a vegetarian. I do not drink. Many Christians are meat eaters and drink, no doubt, but neither meat eating not drinking is enjoined by scripture. Do please read the Bible. I accepted his advice and he got me a copy. I have a faint recollection that he himself used to sell copies of the Bible and I purchased from him an edition containing maps, concordance, and other aids. I began reading it but I could not possibly read through the Old Testament. I read the book of Genesis and the chapters that followed invariably sent me to sleep. But just for the sake of being able to say that I had read it, I plotted through the other books with much difficulty and without the least interest or understanding. I disliked reading the book of Numbers. But the New Testament produced a different impression, especially the Sermon on the Mount, which went straight to my heart. I compared it with the Gita. The verses, but I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man take away thy coat let him have thy cloak too, delighted me beyond measure and put me in mind of Shamel Bats for a bowl of water, give a goodly meal etc. My young mind, try to unify the teaching of the Gita, the light of Asia and the Sermon on the Mount. That renunciation was the highest form of religion appealed to me greatly. This reading whetted my appetite for studying the lives of other religious teachers. A friend recommended Carlyle's Heroes and Hero Worship. I read the chapter on the hero as a prophet and learned of the prophet's greatness and bravery and austere living. Beyond this acquaintance with religion I could not go at the moment as reading for them. Examination left me scarcely any time for outside subjects. But I took mental note of the fact that I should read more religious books and acquaint myself with all the principal religions. And how could I help knowing something of atheism too? Every Indian knew Bradlaugh's name and his so-called atheism. I read some book about it, the name of which I forget. It had no effect on me for I had already crossed the Sahara of atheism. Mrs. Besant who was then very much in the limelight had turned to theism from atheism. I had read her book How I Became a Theosophist. It was about this time that Bralaf died. He was buried in the working cemetery. I attended the funeral as I believe every Indian residing in London did. A few clergymen also were present to do him the last honors. On our way back from the funeral we had to wait at the station for our train. A champion atheist from the crowd heckled one of these clergymen. Well sir, you believe in the existence of God? I do, said the good man in a low tone. You also agree that the circumference of the earth is 28,000 miles, don't you?" said the atheist, with a smile of self-assurance. Indeed. Pray tell me then the size of your God and where he may be. Well, if we but knew, he resides in the hearts of us both. Now, now, don't take me to be a child, said the champion with a triumphant look at us. The clergyman assumed a humble silence. This talk still further increased my prejudice against Atheism. Chapter 21 Nirbal Keskiviko Bea Al Ram Though I had acquired a nodding acquaintance with Hinduism and other religions of the world, I 
should have known that it would not be enough to save me in my trails. Of the thing that sustains. Him through trials man has no inkling, much less knowledge, at the time. If an unbeliever, he will. Attribute his safety to chance. If a believer, he will say God saved him. He will conclude as well. He may, that his religious study or spiritual discipline was at the back of the state of grace within. Him. But in the hour of his deliverance he does not know whether his spiritual discipline or something else saves him. Who that has prided himself on his spiritual strength has not seen it. Humble to the dust? A knowledge of religion, as distinguished from experience, seems but chaff. In such moments of trial, it was in England that I first discovered the futility of mere religious knowledge. How I was saved. On previous occasions is more than I can say, for I was very young then, but now I was twenty. And had gained some experience as husband and father. During the last year, as far as I can remember, of my stay in England, that is in 1890, there was a vegetarian conference at Portsmouth to which an Indian friend and I were invited. Portsmouth is a seaport with a large naval population. It has many houses with women of ill fame, women not actually prostitutes, but at the same time, not very scrupulous about their morals. We were put up in one of these houses. Needles to say, the reception committee did not know anything about it. It would have been difficult in a town like Portsmouth to find out which were good lodgings and which were bad for occasional travelers like us. We returned from the conference in the evening. After dinner we sat down to play a rubber of bridge in which our landlady joined, as is customary in England even in respectable households. Every player indulges in innocent jokes as a matter of course, but here my companion and our hostess began to make indecent ones as well. I did not know that my friend was an adept in the art. It captured me and I also joined it. Just when I was about to go beyond the limit, leaving the cards in the game to themselves, God through the good companion uttered the blessed warning, whence this devil in you, my boy? Be off quick. I was ashamed. I took the warning and expressed within myself gratefulness to my friend. Remembering the vow I had taken before my mother, I fled from the scene. To my room I went. Quaking, trembling, and with beating heart, like a quarry escaped from its pursuer. I recall this as the first occasion on which a woman, other than my wife, moved me to lust. I passed that night sleeplessly, all kinds of thoughts assailing me. Should I leave this house? Should I run away from the place? Where was I? What would happen to me if I had not my wits? About me? I decided to act thenceforth with great caution, not to leave the house, but somehow leave Portsmouth. The conference was not to go on for more than two days, and I remember I left Portsmouth the next evening, my companion staying there some time longer. I did not then know the essence of religion or of God and how he works in us. Only vaguely I understood that God had saved me on that occasion. On all occasions of trial he has saved me. I know that the phrase God saved me has a deeper meaning for me today, and still I feel that I have not yet grasped its entire meaning. Only richer experience can help me to a fuller understanding. But in all my trials of a spiritual nature, as a lawyer, in conducting institutions, and in politics I can say that God saved me. When every hope is gone, when helpers fall and comforts flee, I find that help arrives somehow from I know not where. Supplication, worship. Prayer are no superstition, they are acts more real than the acts of eating, drinking, sitting, or walking. It is no exaggeration to say that they alone are real, all else is unreal. Such worship or prayer is no flight of eloquence, it is no lip homage. It springs from the heart. If, therefore, we achieve that purity of the heart when it is emptied of all but love, if we keep all the chords in proper tune, they trembling pass in music out of sight. Prayer needs no speech. It is itself independent of any sensuous effort. I have not the slightest doubt that prayer is an unfailing means of cleaning the heart of passions. But it must be combined with the utmost humility. Chapter 22 
Narayan Hemchandra. Just about this time Narayan Hemchandra came to England. I had heard of him as a writer. We met at the house of Miss Manning of the National Indian Association. Miss Manning knew that I could not make myself sociable. When I went to her place I used to sit tongue-tied, never speaking except when spoken to. She introduced me to Narayan Hemchandra. He did not know English. His dress was queer a clumsy pair of trousers, a wrinkled, dirty, brown coat after the Parsi fashion, no necktie or collar, and a tasseled woolen cap. He grew a long beard. He was lightly built and short of stature. His round face was scarred with smallpox and had a nose which was neither pointed nor blunt. With his hand he was constantly turning over his beard. Such a queer-looking and queerly dressed person was bound to be singled out in fashionable society. I have heard a good deal about you, I said to him. I have also read some of your writings. I should be very pleased if you were kind enough to come to my place. Narayan Hemchandra had a rather hoarse voice. With a smile on his face he replied, Yes. Where do you stay? In Store Street. Then we are neighbors. I want to learn English. Will you teach me? I shall be happy to teach you anything I can and will try my best. If you like, I will go to your place. Oh no. I shall come to you. I shall also bring with me a translation exercise book. So we made an appointment. Soon we were close friends. Narayan Hemchandra was innocent of grammar. Horse was a verb with him and run a noun I. Remember many such funny instances. But he was not to be baffled by his ignorance. My little knowledge of grammar could make no impression on him. Certainly he never regarded his ignorance of grammar as a matter for shame. With perfect nonchalance he said, I have never felt the need of grammar in expressing my thoughts. Well, do you know Bengali? I know it. I have traveled in Bengal. It is I who have given Maharshi Devendranath Tagore's works to the Gujarati-speaking world. And I wish to translate into Gujarati the treasures of many other translations. I always content myself with bringing out the spirit. Others, with their better knowledge, may be able to do more in future. But I am quite satisfied with what I have achieved without the help of grammar. I know Marathi, Hindi, Bengali. And now I have begun to know English. What I want is a copious vocabulary. And do you think my ambition ends here? No fear. I want to go to France and learn French. I am told that language has an extensive literature. I shall go to Germany also, if possible, and there learn German. And thus he would talk on unceasingly. He had a boundless ambition for learning languages and for foreign travel. Then you will go to America also? Certainly. How can I return to India without having seen the new world? But where will you find the money? What do I need money for? I am not a fashionable fellow like you. The minimum amount of food and the minimum amount of clothing suffice for me. And for this what little I get out of my books and from my friends is enough. I always travel third class. While going to America also I shall travel on deck. Narayan Hemchandra's simplicity was all his own and his frankness was on a par with it. Of pride. He had not the slightest trace, excepting, of course, a rather undue regard for his own capacity as a writer. We met daily. There was a considerable amount of similarity between our thoughts and actions. Both of us were vegetarians. We would often have our lunch together. This was the time when I lived on 17th. A week and cooked for myself. Sometimes when I would go to his room and Sometimes he would come to mine. I cooked in the English style. Nothing but Indian style would satisfy him. He would not do without Dal. I would make soup of carrots etc. and he would pity me for my taste. 
once he somehow hunted out Mung cooked it and brought it to my place. I ate it. With delight. This led on to a regular system of exchange between us. I would take my delicacies. To him and he would bring his to me. Cardinal Manning's name was then on every lip. The dock laborer's strike had come to an early. Termination owing to the efforts of John Burns and Cardinal Manning. I told Narayan Hemchandra. Of Disraeli's tribute to the Cardinal's simplicity. Then I must see the sage, said he. He is a big man. How do you expect to meet him? Why? I know how. I must get you to write to him in my name. Tell him I am an author and that I want to congratulate him personally on his humanitarian work and also say that I shall have to take you as interpreter as I do not know English. I wrote a letter to that effect. In two or three days came Cardinal Manning's card in reply giving us an appointment. So we both called on the Cardinal. I put on the usual visiting suit. Narayan. Hemchandra was the same as ever, in the same coat and the same trousers. I tried to make fun of this, but he laughed me out and said, You civilized fellows are all cowards. Great men never look at a person's exterior. They think of his heart. We entered the Cardinal's mansion. As soon as we were seated, a thin, tall, old gentleman made his appearance and shook hands with us. Narayan Hemchandra thus gave his greetings. I do not want to take up your time. I had heard a lot about you and I felt I should come and thank you for the good work you done for the strikers. It has been my custom to visit the sages of the world and that is why I have put you to this trouble. This was of course my translation of that he spoke in Gujarati. I am glad you have come. I hope your stay in London will agree with you and that you will get in touch with people here. God bless you. With these words the Cardinal stood up and said goodbye. Once Narayan Hemchandra came to my place in a shirt and dhoti. The good landlady opened the door, came running to me in a fright this was a new landlady who did not know Narayan. Hemchandra and said, a sort of a madcap wants to see you. I went to the door and to my surprise found Narayan Hemchandra. I was shocked. His face, however, showed nothing but his usual smile. But did not the children in the street rag you? Well, they ran after me, but I did not mind them and they were quiet. Narayan Hemchandra went to Paris after a few months' stay in London. He began studying French and also translating French books. I knew enough French to revise his translation, so he gave it to me to read. It was not a translation, it was the substance. Finally he carried out his determination to visit America. It was with great difficulty that he succeeded in securing a duck ticket. While in the United States he was prosecuted for being indecently dressed as he once went out in a shirt and dhoti. I have a recollection that he was discharged. Chapter 23 The Great Exhibition there was a great exhibition at Paris in 1890. I had read about its elaborate preparations and I also had a keen desire to see Paris. So I thought I had better combine two things in one and go there at this juncture. A particular attraction of the exhibition was the Eiffel Tower constructed entirely of iron and nearly 1000 feet high. There were of course many other things of interest. But the tower was the chief one, inasmuch as it had been supposed till then that a structure of that height could not safely stand. I had heard of a vegetarian restaurant in Paris. I engaged a room there and stayed seven days. I managed everything very economically, both the journey to Paris and the sightseeing there. This I did mostly on foot and with the help of a map of Paris, as also a map of the guide to the exhibition. These were enough to direct one to the main streets and chief places of interest. I remember nothing of the exhibition excepting its magnitude and variety. I have fair recollection of the Eiffel Tower as I ascended it twice or thrice. There was a restaurant on the first platform. And just for the satisfaction of being able to say that I had had my lunch at a great height I threw away seven shillings on it. 
The ancient churches of Paris are still in my memory. Their grandeur and their peacefulness are unforgettable. The wonderful construction of Notre Dame and the elaborate decoration of them. Interior with its beautiful sculptures cannot be forgotten. I felt then that those who expended millions on such divine cathedrals could not but have the love of God in their hearts. I had read a lot about the fashions and frivolity of Paris. These were in evidence in every street. But the churches stood noticeably apart from these scenes. A man would forget the outside noise and bustle as soon as he entered one of these churches. His manner would change, he would behave with dignity and reverence as he passed someone kneeling before the image of the Virgin. The feeling I had then has since been growing on me that all this kneeling and prayer could not be mere superstition, the devout souls kneeling before the Virgin could not be worshipping me a mortal. They were fired with genuine devotion and they worshipped not stone. But the divinity of which it was symbolic. I have an impression that I felt then that by this worship, they were not detracting from, but increasing, the glory of God. I must say a word about the Eiffel Tower. I do not know what purpose it serves today. But I then heard it greatly disparaged as well as praised. I remember that Tolstoy was the chief among those who disparaged it. He said that the Eiffel Tower was a monument of man's folly, not of his wisdom. Tobacco, he argued, was the worst of all intoxicants inasmuch as a man addicted to it was tempted to commit crimes which a drunkard never dared to do, liquor made a man mad, but tobacco clouded his intellect and made him build castles in the air. The Eiffel Tower was one of the creations of a man under such influence. There is no art about the Eiffel Tower. In no way can it be said to have contributed to the real beauty of the exhibition. Men flocked to see it and ascended it as it was a novelty and of unique dimensions. It was the toy of the exhibition. So long. As we are children we are attracted by toys and the tower was a good demonstration of the fact that we are all children attracted by trinkets. That may be claimed to be the purpose served by the Eiffel Tower. Chapter 24 Called Beauty then? I have deferred saying anything up to now about the purpose for which I went to England, viz. Being called to the bar. It is time to advert to it briefly. There were two conditions which had to be fulfilled before a student was formally called to the bar, keeping terms, 12 terms equivalent to about three years, and passing examinations. Keeping terms meant eating one's terms, i.e. attending at least six out of about 24 dinners in a term. Eating did not mean actually partaking of the dinner, it meant reporting oneself at the fixed hours and remaining present throughout the dinner. Usually of course everyone ate and drank the good commons and choice wines provided. A dinner cost from two and six to three and six that is from two to three rupees. This was considered moderate inasmuch as one had to pay that same amount for wines alone if one dined at a hotel. To us in India it is a matter for surprise, if we are not civilized, that the cost of drink should exceed the cost of food. The first revelation gave me a great shock and I wondered how people had the heart to throw away so much money on drink. Later I came to understand. I often ate nothing at these dinners for them. Things that I might eat were only bread, boiled potato and cabbage. In the beginning I did not eat. These, as I did not like them, and later, when I began to relish them, I also gained the courage to ask for other dishes. The dinner provided for the benchers used to be better than that for the students. A Parsi student, who was also a vegetarian, and I applied, in the interests of vegetarianism, for the vegetarian courses which were served to the benchers. The application was granted, and we began to get fruits and other vegetables from the benchers' table. Two bottles of wine allowed to each group of four, and as I did not touch them, I was ever in. Demand to form a quarter, so that three might empty two bottles. And there was a grand night in. Each term went extra wines. I was therefore specially requested to attend and was in great. Demand on that grand night. I could see then, nor have I seen since, how these dinners qualified the students better for them. 
bar. There was once a time when only a few students used to attend these dinners and thus there were opportunities for talks between them and the benchers and speeches were also made. These occasions helped to give them knowledge of the world with a sort of polish and refinement and also improved their power of speaking. No such thing was possible in my time as the benchers had a table all to themselves. The institution had gradually lost all its meaning but conservative England retained it nevertheless. The curriculum of study was easy, barristers being humorously known as dinner barristers. Everyone knew that the examinations had practically no value. In my time there were two, one in Roman law and the other in common law. There were regular textbooks prescribed for these examinations which could be taken in compartments but scarcely anyone read them. I have known many to pass the Roman law examination by scrambling through notes on Roman law in a couple of weeks and the common law examination by reading notes on the subject in two or three months. Question papers were easy and examiners were generous. The percentage of passes in the Roman law examination used to be 95 to 99 and of those in the final examination, 75 or even more. There was thus little fear of being plucked and examinations were held not once but four times in a year. They could not be felt as a difficulty, but I succeeded in turning them into one. I felt that I should read all the textbooks. It was a fraud. I thought not to read these books. I invested much money in them. I decided to read Roman law in Latin. The Latin which I had acquired in the London matriculation stood me in good stead. And all this reading was not without its value later on in South Africa where Roman Dutch is the common law. The reading of Justinian, therefore, helped me a great deal in understanding the South African law. It took me nine months of fairly hard labor to read through the common law of England. 4. Broome's Common Law, a big but interesting volume, took up a good deal of time. Snell's Equity was full of interest but a bit hard to understand. White and Tudor's leading cases from which certain cases were prescribed was full of interest and instruction. I read also with interest. Williams and Edwards' real property and Gadeev's personal property. Williams' book read like a novel. The one book I remember to have read on my return to India with the same unflagging interest was Maine's Hindu law. But it is out of place to talk here of Indian law books. I passed my examinations, was called to the bar on the 10th of June 1891 and enrolled in the High Court on the 11th. On the 12th sailed for home. But notwithstanding my study there was no end to my helplessness and fear. I did not feel myself qualified to practice law. But a separate chapter is needed to describe this helplessness of mine. Chapter 25 My Helplessness It was easy to be called but it was difficult to practice at the bar. I had read the laws but not learn how to practice law. I had read with interest legal maxims but did not know how to apply them in my profession. Secutura tua ut alienum non litus, use your property in such a way as not to damage that of others, was one of them, but I was at a loss to know how one could employ this maxim for the benefit of one's client. I had read all the leading cases on this maxim, but they gave me no confidence in the application of it in the practice of law. Besides, I had learned nothing at all of Indian law. I had not the slightest idea of Hindu and Mohammedan law. I had not even learned how to draft a plaint and felt completely at sea. I had heard of Sir Farazesh Mehta as one who roared like a lion in law courts. How, I wondered, could he have learned the art in England? It was out of the question for me ever to acquire his legal acumen, but I had serious misgivings as to whether I should be able even to earn a living by he profession. I was torn with these doubts and anxieties to some of my friends. One of them suggested that I should seek data by Neoroji's advice. I have already said that when I went to England, I possessed a note of introduction to data by. I availed myself of it very late. I thought I had no 
right to trouble such a great man for an interview. Whenever an address by him was announced, I would attend it, listen to him from a corner of the hall, and go away after having feasting my eyes and ears. In order to come in close touch with the students he had founded an association I used to attend its meeting and rejoiced at Databy's solicitude for the students and the latter's respect for him in course of time I mustered up courage to present to him the note of introduction. He said, you can come and have my advice whenever you like. But I never availed myself of his offer. I thought it wrong to trouble him without the most pressing necessity. Therefore I dared not venture to accept my friend's advice to submit my difficulties to Databy at that time. I forget. Now whether it was the same friend or someone else who recommended me to meet Mr. Frederick Pincut. He was a conservative but his affection for Indian students was pure and unselfish. Many students sought his advice and I also applied to him for an appointment, which he granted. I can never forget that interview. He greeted me as a friend. He laughed away my pessimism. Do you think, he said, that everyone must be a Pharisee Pharisees. Skill to be an ordinary lawyer. Common honesty and industry are enough to enable him to make a living. All cases are not complicated. Well, let me know the extent of your general reading. When I acquainted him with my little stock of reading, he was, as I could see, rather disappointed. But it was only for a moment. Soon his face beamed with a pleasing smile and he said, I understand your trouble. Your general reading is meager. You have no knowledge of the world, eh? Sign Quanon for a vakil. You have not even read the history of India. A vakil should know human nature. He should be able to read a man's character from his face. And every Indian ought to know Indian history. This has no connection with the practice of law, but you ought to have that knowledge. I see that you have not even read K. and Mallison's history of the mutiny of 1857. Get hold of that at once and also read two more books to understand human nature. These were Lavater's and Schemmelpenick's books on physiognomy. I was extremely grateful to this venerable friend. In his presence I found all my fear gone, but as soon as I left him I began to worry again. To know a man from his face was the question that haunted me as I thought of the two books on my way home. The next day I purchased Lavater's book. Schemmelpenick's was not available at the shop. I read Lavater's book and found it more difficult than Snell's equity and scarcely interesting. I studied Shakespeare's physiognomy, but did not acquire the knack of finding out the Shakespeare's walking up and down the streets of London. Lavater's book did not add to my knowledge. Mr. Pincut's advice did me very little direct service, but his kindliness stood me in good stead. His smiling open face stayed in my memory, and I trusted his advice that Pharisee Meta's acumen, memory and ability were not essential to. The making of a successful lawyer, honesty and industry were enough. And as I had a fair share. Of these last I felt somewhat reassured. 